And there are plans to expand indoctrination. That's right. Well, Idahoans are also concerned. Horror shot. That line would be moving a little bit farther west. I'm like crying. Nobody wants to Dark see. Dark money is influencing policy in our state. Well, that's not how this works. Well, hello there and welcome to Nowhere to Hide. I'm Brian Hyde and we're going to be talking today about enemy of the public. Who could it be? Could it be Ammon Bundy? Could it be Sarah Brady? Could it be... The media itself, you know, a Rasmussen poll recently actually showed that um, a pretty high number, 35 percent of those respondents out of like a thousand two people that were questioned said, yeah, the media actually is our greatest enemy at this point. Kind of makes you wonder why on earth would they say something like that? Surely they, they must be right wing extremists or otherwise, uh, you know, under the spell of some uh, some right wing Svengali who is is trying to encourage, uh, I, don't, I don't know, Christian nationalism or freedom or some other subversive thing other than bending the knee to uh, whomever is in power at the moment. Hmm. Well, why don't we start with an example of why people might have, oh, I don't know, trust issues with the media. This seems like as good a place to start since we're right on the cusp of, of Pride Month. And a good force feeding is coming our way, courtesy of the media. This is in response to uh, the uh, target uh, being found out that they were they were uh, marketing LGBTQ plus blah 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 merchandise, particularly trans merchandise, to children. And if you look at the bottom of the slide here, uh, it's from KUTV News. This is actually in Salt Lake City, which this affects a, a Layton, Utah store. A target in Layton was evacuated after officials said they were informed of a bomb threat to multiple Utah locations. They said the threat mentioned Target's Pride merchandise displays. Now, when you see a headline like that, what are you going to infer? <gasps> Ooh, we knew there were people that were making noise about, well, you don't like Target carrying, you know, LGBTQ merchandise. And, you know, someone made a threat. The threat mentioned targets pride merchandise displays. I think I think the dots that they're trying to get us to connect here are that uh, somehow those extremists on the far right are now calling in bomb threats or threatening violence because we all know that uh, LGBTQ, as you're about to see over the next month, are the most marginalized, picked on, unaccepted, and, and uh, least appreciated group in all of American history. Yes, that was sarcasm. So if your sarcasm detector just uh, started emitting sparks and burst into flames, it's working as it was supposed to. The trouble is, this was reported with an ambiguity that didn't really offer clarity. It was, you know, very quick. Well, you know, of course, you know, when people pass laws that, uh, you know, prevent uh, the surgical mutilation of, of trans kids or, you know, the, the application of, of uh, life-changing hormones to these kids, you know, this is what you can expect. Violence, violence, violence. And, of course, uh, the parody account, Idaho Fear Foundation, just couldn't help themselves. They, uh, Their knee jerked, and well, off they went on a flight of fancy. Well, I sure hope there's condemnation from the Idaho Freedom Caucus, Hearst for Idaho, and more. Their fake outrage helps to spur senseless threats such as these. All right, let me get my best Paul Harvey on, and let's see what happens with the rest of the story. Here we go. It's a, it's a news headline from the Daily Mail online. Utah Target evacuated after it received a bomb threat for, quote, turning its back on the LGBT community after Pride Collection walk back. So Target pulled a lot of this stuff off the shelves or they moved it to the back of the store. They Basically, they, they stopped showcasing it up front. And it was apparently some misguided LGBTQ plus advocate who was upset about this and said, well, we're not going to cower and we're not going to back down and started phoning, phoning in bomb threats or emailing bomb threats to various Target loca locations around the country. Not surprising for anybody who's ever heard the name Jussie Smollett. Not surprising for anybody who's been paying attention to the left-wing violence over the last three years, the mostly peaceful protests. In fact, it was really funny. A couple of people on Twitter actually posted pictures of a looted Target store and said, look at what happened. Right-wing protesters came in and looted this Target over the fact that it was carrying LGBT merchandise. And then somewhere in the fine print, it was, I'm just kidding. This was what happened in 2020 after the death of George Floyd. Kind of an interesting double standard on the part of the press, but uh, hey, at least we can't accuse them of having no standards at all. So with that, uh, with that bit of manipulation, we should probably approach anything that we read about in the media or hear in the media with a, well, a strong sense of skepticism. Oh, look, here's another example. Here's the headline from KTVB, Meridian Park mom who asked police to arrest her, files tort claim for $500,000. Yeah, it's right there in the headline. Sarah Walton Brady 
asked police to arrest her. Now, look, <laughs> if you haven't seen the video footage of this, at no point did she say, please, for the sake of society, please, would you arrest me? She never said please at all. The officer threatened to arrest her. She was standing her ground. By the way, she had every right to stand her ground. There was no reason to kick them out of that park. It was just, this was official busybodiness, run amok. And when someone had the courage, the temerity to stand up and say, no, we don't need to do that. Look, at people are outside. We are safe. There is nobody at risk here. The police officer decided to flex, telling her, well, you will, you will leave or I will uh, arrest you. At which point she said, do it. Turned around, put her hands behind her back. That's a that's more of a call out. That's more like if you're stupid enough, go ahead, do it, which he did. His ego was bruised at that point, and and thus started this snowball rolling. Um, you know, I know not everybody's going to agree. Not everybody's going to see that uh, Sarah was in the right. Time will 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 show that uh, she actually was in the right. How do we know this? Because it turns out all of those lockdowns, all of those stay-at-home orders, the shutdown of business, the denial of the right to gather, to go to church and worship with other people did nothing to stop the virus. And it wouldn't have. Even if people obeyed it, the virus still would it would have spread. It was, it was just simply authoritarians trying to be an authority. And in this case, a particular authoritarian cop got his feelings hurt and decided he was going to make an example out of this mom. Well, now Sarah has filed a tort claim indicating she may very well sue. But it's just so disingenuous for KTVB to say, well, you know, she asked. And I think it was actually Idaho Press that uh, that first reported this. She asked to be, to be arrested, which, of course, brings the usual chorus of bootlickers out going, well, you know, she asked for it. And then now she wants money. She's just being a grifter because that's how they think. Nobody could possibly be harmed by the state. No one could possibly, you know, find themselves on the wrong side of the law, not through their own error, but through the error of some bureaucracy. And so, therefore, the only possible reason is she's just trying to get money from people. Well, Brady was one of several parents who took their children to a playground at Julius M. Kleiner Memorial Park, which had closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, the park didn't close. Officials declared nobody can go there without any good reason to deny them from being in that public space. Brady and others argued with Meridian police officers about the constitutionality of the decision to close the park. Brady then turned, put her arms behind her back, and she did not ask the officer to arrest her. She dared him to do it. Now, you may say, well, then he had no choice to, but he does. If, if, he had, if he had more of a brain and less of an ego, he would have realized, you know what, this wasn't going to make the community any safer. This was solely about his authority had been questioned, and now his ego was bruised, and so he had to do something to, you know, protect his fragile ego, you know, in the face of this mom standing up to him. I mean, there was other moms standing up. There was kids. What are they going to think? This big, tough police officer, how could he possibly back down? Now, the article tries to gaslight us into saying, well, you know, tensions were high throughout the state and the country at the time during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Why were those tensions so high? I can tell you it, it must have had something to do with the fact that the press was incessantly beating the drum about, you know, refrigerator trucks because the morgues were overflowing and bodies stacking up like cordwood. And oh my gosh, anybody, if you go near anybody, if you're within six feet, if you don't walk all in the same direction down this grocery store aisle, everybody's going to get COVID and, and, and they're going to die. Look, we have this, you know, blood red background and this number that's continually ticking higher of all the cases, all the deaths. It was the most manufactured fear that I think most of us have seen in our lifetime. So a few days before Brady was arrested, the article says a protest against Governor Brad Little's stay-at-home order drew hundreds of people. Brady's arrest also set off protests in front of the home of the Meridian police officer who made the arrest. Well, he wanted attention or he wanted to secure his ego. Now he has a bigger audience in which to do that. The article says in January, Idaho Attorney General Raul Labrador dismissed the charges against her. Now, keep in mind, this was in April of 2020, three years ago, and it was in January of this year that the Attorney General, the newly sworn in Attorney General, dismissed the charges against her to the dismay of Meridian Mayor Robert Simison and Police Chief Tracy, Tracy Bastarichia. Simison called Labrador's what he calls selective dismissal of the case an endorsement of illegal behavior abhorrent and a breach of his oath of office to uphold the rule of law. That's statist speak for we cannot be wrong. 
We are in authority and therefore we cannot ever be wrong. Bastard Ritchie said he hoped the dismissal of charges is not the type of political grandstanding we should expect coming out of the Attorney General's office moving forward. No, Chief. Uh, actually, the political grandstanding was what Lawrence Wasden was doing by keeping those charges alive and keeping dragging out the process over nearly three years. I know there were people who were concerned, well, how on earth did Sarah Brady rack up a $50,000 legal bill? And it's because the state kept continuing her case and kept pushing it down the road. Whoa, we have concerns about COVID. Oh, we have concerns about this. And they just kept kicking that can down the road as the costs continued to mount. Almost as if they were trying to simply wear her down or at least outspend her to the point where she finally said, okay, I'll just, I'll take a plea, be, a plea bargain and call it good. But she wouldn't do it. And so it was, it was finally in January when Lawrence Wasden finally, gratefully, rode off into the sunset that uh, Raul Labrador took office. And one of the first things he did was he said, enough of this nonsense. He talked with the other attorney generals who, who had to deal with this or the other deputy attorney generals, and they all agreed. There is no reason to keep this case alive. And again, this was a trespassing case against a mom who defied an officer who was ordering her get out of the park. Now, look. I know there are those who are like, well, you never, ever defy an officer. But I, I'm going to ask you, in all seriousness, when is it permissible to stand up for your rights? And she did it peacefully. It wasn't like she went swinging at him. She wasn't, you know, threatening anybody. She simply dared him to arrest her. Go ahead. Go ahead. She turned around, put her hands behind her. Go ahead, arrest me. And he did it. Did it serve the interest of justice? I know there were people, well, she needs to be in jail. Why? Well, she broke a law. Really? Or did she just, you know, tread on this officer's feeling? And the closest thing we could find is a trespass charge. It was an area where she had every right to be. And the state wouldn't let it go until an adult entered the room and said, enough. Let's let this go. Now, of course, no good deed goes unpunished. And, of course, the Idaho Capital Sun is very quick to pile on now with another uh, hit piece on uh, the attorney general. Lawyer exodus from AG's office is compromised. Idaho Health and Welfare says the director of Idaho Health and Welfare. Six of eight deputies, deputy attorneys general who were central to Idaho Department of Health and Welfare Administration have left since March. Now, they make this sound like, oh my goodness, you know, uh, Raul is on, on the war path against Idaho Health and Welfare. But let's keep in mind that Health and Welfare has been involved in a couple of things that deserve a little extra scrutiny. One, the kidnapping of baby Cyrus just over a year ago. And secondly, there was uh, money that was being spent to... Uh, let's say, put some things in front of kids that really were questionable as to whether or not the state should be involved in that in the first place. This is why Attorney General Labrador was asking for accountability. And apparently there were at least, uh, you know, six rats that were like, well, you know, we're going to leave the sinking ship. Six of the eight top attorneys assigned to the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare have quit or been fired by Idaho Attorney General Raul Labrador since March. Some of those lawyers made a loud exit pointing to Labrador's increasingly complicated relationship with the department he is legally required to represent. Now, again, I'm going to have to point out, as a state agency, yes, he may have to represent them in some controversies. That does not mean that he has to cover for them if they are in the wrong. He was elected by the people of the state of Idaho. And that is who he is ultimately accountable to. He was not elected by the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, which if they're engaged in wrongdoing or questionable practices, they need to be scrutinized and, if necessary, called out and held accountable. Labrador promised in his campaign for attorney general to overhaul how the office operates. Since taking office, he's created a new position in the, uh, in the office's executive team and pledged to change how the office provides legal advice. He also turned a critical eye to health and welfare. He opened an investigation into what he believes may have been illegal activities surrounding pandemic-era grants to child care providers, sought records to investigate child protection cases, and his office has fought attempts by health and welfare officials to block Labrador's investigative demands. I'm sorry, I, I don't like it when people use this phrase, but I think this is where it could be used. If you're not guilty, you have nothing to fear. That's more true, by the way, for a state agency than, than for even a private citizen. At least with a private citizen, we have the presumption of innocence, or we're supposed to. If you work for the state, you're running on taxpayer dollars, you should be held to a higher level of scrutiny. And therefore, you should have ultimate transparency and, and not try to hide behind, well, we have to obfuscate and, and otherwise, you know, keep this in the dark. Now, here's the complaint from Health and Welfare Director Dave Jeppesen. 
The loss of so much specialized legal knowledge, expertise, experience, and history at one time has compromised the department's ability to carry out the laws and policies that the legislature has enacted via statute. This will create a direct negative impact to Idaho families, vulnerable adults, and children that the legislature has directed the department to serve. So it's all about, we got to keep the people in there. The bureaucracy needs the bureaucrats who are vetted and who will not rock the boat or will not call attention to things that are, shall we say, uh, out of step with what it should be doing. Now, Labrador argues the, depart the departures are an isolated purge of personnel who weren't the best candidates for those jobs under his administration. And he points out what should be telling is that in every other division, we haven't had this issue. So that tells you the problem is not with that office or with my leadership but it's with the culture in that division, meaning health and welfare. In fact, many of these divisions are very excited about the changes that are happening. Labrador told the Idaho Capital Sun in interviews last week he believes the turnover will bring improvement. He isn't leaving the positions open as attorneys leave. In fact, Jeppesen said Labrador has only filled, that, uh, filled two of the six attorneys' jobs so far. Both are new to health and welfare and do not come with the knowledge or expertise in many of the complex and nuanced services that the Idaho legislature requires via statute for the department to provide to Idaho families, vulnerable, vulnerable adults, and children. So he's arguing that only the people who are experienced are really the ones that we can trust in this department. And again, I, I don't know, but that sure sounds a lot like we need people who we know are, you know, one of us. Made men and women who aren't going to, you know, blow the whistle on things that may be questionable. And this this appeal to experience, too. Are, are we to believe that uh, this is such a complicated thing that only those who have been in the long-term bureaucracy could ever figure it out? Because I don't think government is supposed to be that complicated. And, and politicians sometimes do this. Well, you know, I'm a very experienced politician. And I just would like to offer up the idea that maybe there are some things that uh, for which that's that's actually a negative. I mean, do you want a more experienced grifter? You want a more experienced prostitute? I mean, this experience isn't always all that it's that it's uh, vetted to be. A more experienced gang member might be a more appropriate way to put it. Bottom line is, yes, there are some changes that are taking place, and and this is, I think this is really telling. I'm going to share one more quote here from uh, Raúl Labrador. The son asked Labrador if the exodus could be a sign of low morale or as a result of his inquiry into whether the department broke the law under the guidance of his deputy attorney generals. He said he doesn't think it has anything to do with that. Now listen to his answer. He says, I think it makes government more efficient to get rid of people who do not understand what the proper role of government is and that don't understand that there are limits to what unelected bureaucrats can do in their offices and to replace them with lawyers who understand that role. Labrador said, I think the only people that benefit from that are the people of Idaho. He's absolutely right. And this is what it comes down. This is why the press is taking such a harsh stance right now. Well, you know, he's he's talking nonsense and he's just doing political favors. Well, what he's doing is he is, is making sure that the limits on government are being observed. Whereas these long-term bureaucrats have been trained to ignore those limits or pretend that they don't really exist in, in, in order to do whatever it is that they want to do. That's the statist mindset, the idea that anything that's not under the control of the state is by definition out of control or might makes right. We're the state. We have the power. We have the authority. We have your tax dollars, which you don't have a choice, but to give us, we'll take them from you by force or threat of force. It's really nice to know that at least there, there's, there's one elected leader in Idaho who is holding the line and saying there are some things the state ought not be doing or there are places where its proper role is being exceeded. I really wish the governor would would take a similar note, but uh, I think we had our chance and, and kind of blew that in, in the last gubernatorial election. All right, moving on. They're not your kids. They're our kids, says uh, one of our resident Marxists. This is Representative Lauren N N Nicotia. Um, in an article in IdahoEdNews.org, and, and look, I want to believe she's coming at this from a place of sincerity, and and, and maybe she is, but there's something very chilling about this. Idaho Republican politicians either kick the can down the road or are openly, openly hostile to solving our child care crisis. We need to start investing in our youngest kids like almost every other state. Okay, it is a certainty when a politician starts to talk about investing. 
They are not talking about putting their own money at risk or or even even their own uh, you know their own cronies money at risk. They're talking about taxpayers' money. It is, it is essential that we spend other people's money for the programs that I support. They make it sound so noble. And by the way, they will expect you to thank them and shake their hand and make goo-goo eyes at them for, for doing this. Let's dive into her commentary. She says, quality child care is essential. All right, seems pretty obvious. It is the key to healthy development of our youngest children. Now, I'm going to stop right here and say, and, and so whose responsibility does that need to be? Parents, yes. Well, she says, it is also a building block of our economy because parents can't work without it. Whoa, that's pretty quick. So we want the parents out in the workforce. Okay, what about the kids? Well, sadly, she says, nearly half of Idaho families lack access to the care they need, and the challenges are especially severe in rural areas. She's talking about putting kids into child care, subsidized child care. As the Idaho legislature continues to kick the can down the road, our child care crisis will only become worse. Now, she says most families rely on two income earners to get by, which means finding child care. Now, look, I, I'm not trying to put all the problems here on on this, this poor representative, but do you suppose that the expensive nature of living right now has anything whatsoever to do with the fact that we have too much government? too many taxes, too many fees, too much regulation that makes everything more expensive. After all, government doesn't create its own wealth. It can only confiscate from others. And every program has to be paid for, has to be maintained, tends to grow. If it's not uh, growing, it's, it's dying. So I wonder why two parents need to work. Is it possible that when we could get by with one income families, that was a product of we had less government to deal with at that time? Just, just a thought. Idaho was short and estimated uh, by before the pandemic, rather, she says Idaho was short and estimated 20,000 child care spots, according to the nonprofit organization, Idaho Voices for Children. Since then, over 200 child care businesses permanently closed, resulting in an even greater shortage. Well, gee, if their parents were home to care for them, maybe that wasn't such a bad thing. She says the shortage impacts our workforce and economy. For working parents, it leads to missed work days and even being pushed out of the labor market. Employers experience higher turnover and an inability to fill open positions. In fact, Idaho loses an estimated $479 million each year in costs to business and lost tax revenue due to child care issues. Idaho government loses $479 million each year. Conversely, investments in our in our kids yield long-term dividends. Now, this is taxpayer money being spent. Every dollar invested, every taxpayer dollar being spent in quality preschool returns up to $16 to our economy by better preparing our children to become productive, self-sufficient adults. But we first start them by being dependent on government to provide that uh, that child care. I'm sorry, I'd like to see the math as to how it, it's a it's a 16 to 1 return on every dollar spent. She says the biggest challenge families face is financial. Idaho parents pay hundreds of dollars each month for child care with the market rate for one infant costing upwards of $800, more than the cost of full-time in-state tuition at Boise State University. The math isn't working too, working for too many Idaho families or Republican lawmakers vacillate between ignoring the problem and making it worse. Oh, it's all their fault. Why? Because they're not spending more of the taxpayers' money. This, this is... Uh, this is circular argumentation on her part. Well, if only they would do what we tell them. Idaho is one of a handful of states that refuses to invest any state funding to make preschool and child care more accessible. Again, at the taxpayer's expense. That's the question you always ask, at whose expense? Well, that's at the taxpayer's expense. In 2021, GOP representatives rejected a three-year, three $18 million federal grant that Idaho was awarded to support homegrown early learning solutions across the state. One Idaho legislature declared he would oppose any bill that makes it easier or more convenient for mothers to come out of the home. Now, that may sound really, whoa, that's counterculture. And I guess it, compared to today's standards, maybe it is. But the bottom line is, the more people who can have mom in the home, the better. I'm sorry, but that really is one of the great recipes for success. You may say it's sexist. I'm just saying that uh, the more we put children in the care of other people who cannot be paid to love our children as much as we love them, the less desirable we're going to result we're going to get on the other side of that. 
Nobody loves your kid as much as you. Nobody will do a better job of instilling your values than you. But I kind of believe that maybe that's the point. It's it's not about, uh, well, we just want to get more people out there and productive in the economy because that's how we define success. No, success is defined as raising kids that are, are healthy, happy, and productive. It has very little to do with, uh, and, and look at all the zeros behind that paycheck. Wow. One more thought here. This year, Republicans voted against distributing federal funds to child care businesses struggling to keep their doors open. In other words, she's complaining that Republicans failed to subsidize private businesses. Now, only after severe public outcry and protests by child care providers and parents, who apparently have become accustomed to sucking the teat of the state, did they reverse course. But this funding stream will end soon. Why? Because it's not an endless bank account that you can just reach into forever and take money. Putting even more pressure on working families, child care providers, and businesses struggling to find workers. She says, as an Idaho Democrat, I've been frustrated watching re the Republican supermajority throw away promising opportunities for our kids. Well, what she calls promising opportunities. We understand that investments in our youngest children are the wisest investments we can make. Again, substitute the word spending of other people's money for the word investment. And we will continue to advocate for their future. After all, it is the children who matter. And if we are spending money for the children, then that is the wisest investment. No, this is just this is just government creating programs and dependency. And then what happens when those kids are in these programs? I mean, look, I'm not trying to start any rumors here. and I'm not try, trying to spread any fear. But uh, it seems like some people have taken a very keen interest in kids lately. We'll probably hear a little bit more about this in the coming month. But uh, our libraries, for instance... Let me just give you a little illustration. It's it's kind of hard to see there, but up on the top shelf, that would be, uh, let's see, math, reading, science, uh, oh yeah, history. That's all up on the top shelf. But look what's easily accessible. Let's talk about it. This book is gay, flamer, and a bunch of other, you know, LGBTQ propaganda. You may say that's harsh, but it's true. This is the stuff that, that some people, well-intended people, really want to make easily available to our kids. Is that such a good idea? Parents, I know it's a tough choice. And and look, I want to I want to maintain my lifestyle as much as the next person. But if if school or daycare has just become the convenient way for you to go out there and earn money, which you're going to be taxed on anyways, is it possible that there's a better use of your time? Maybe if you were spending more time with your kids than handing them off to somebody else including well-intentioned Democrats who are quote investing, you know, other people's money to take care of your kids might be something to think about. You know, we have this choice and I'm not saying that it's necessarily an easy one, but if your choice or the choice you're being offered involves handing your kids over to somebody else who can't possibly love them the way that you love them, you might want to think about that choice long and hard before you jump in with both feet. I'm Brian Hyde and this is Nowhere to Hide. Reporters are biased, the Idaho Press Club are biased, all media, newspaper, radio. To be completely blunt here, Brian, and there are plans to expand indoctrination. That's right. Well, Idahoans are also concerned. Horror shot. That line would be moving a little bit farther west. I'm like crying. Nobody wants to Dark see. Dark money is influencing policy in our state. Well, that's not how this works.